sexual violence against women has become a national priority, and we are having incredible conversations in the media, in classrooms, in boardrooms, and at dinner tables around the United States that are creating a climate truly galvanized for change. But while the visibility surrounding the issue has increased, the violence itself has not ended. And what that tells me is we need to move beyond visibility and generate a solution that ends sexual violence for all people. What that demands is truly understanding the scope of the problem and appreciating who is at the greatest risk of experiencing sexual violence. In our country, we have a dominant narrative of who the sexual assault survivor is. And that narrative is impacted by the media, like the women of the Time's Up movement, Dateline, CNN, The Today Show, and of course by storylines on Law & Order SVU. These things, combined with our personal experiences and social ideas about violence and who can experience it, converge to create a rather singular idea of who the sexual assault survivor is. And I imagine that if we compared notes, we'd come up with a pretty similar image, that that person would definitely be female, likely white, probably under 40, typically thin, and always straight. And this narrative holds a surprising amount of power as it impacts our legislation, how we build programming, how we spend money, and our social sympathies towards survivors. Most simply, this narrative is of the white, female, straight survivor. And to be clear, this narrative isn't wrong. It's real and it's important, but it is incomplete. It is incomplete because it does not represent the experiences and stories of people at the greatest risk of experiencing sexual violence, the LGBTQ community. The data we have surrounding assault against LGBTQ people is alarming. We know that 44% of lesbians will be raped, experience physical violence, or stalking by the hands of an intimate partner, compared to 35% of straight women. We know that gay and bisexual men are both twice as likely as straight men to experience sexual harassment, and that one in two bisexual women will be raped in their life, and one in two people who identify as transgender will experience sexual violence. And I want to repeat those last two statistics because they are so important, that one in two bi women and one in two trans folks will experience sexual violence at least one time in their life. That is 50%. And that number is not just alarming, it is unacceptable. And because sexual orientation and gender identity do not live in silos, and we are complex beings with multiple identities, we necessarily have to take an intersectional lens to this issue. And when we do, we see that LGBTQ people of color are more likely to experience all forms of violence, including sexual violence, and that LGBTQ people who are unstably housed, have a disability, are imprisoned, or do sex work, or at an exponentially greater risk. Now, I have suggested that our cultural narrative is incomplete because it does not reflect those experiences and stories, but maybe I need to pause and take a step further back, because maybe the problem begins before this narrative is reinforced to the exclusion of the LGBTQ community. Maybe the problem begins before the narrative is written. Maybe it's written in a different language a language that doesn't translate to the queer community, communities of color, or anyone who shares a marginalized identity. So bear with me. Have you ever traveled abroad or tried to communicate to somebody in a different language? It's just you and them alone in a room. There's no Google Translate or pen and paper. I think we can all remember those feelings of confusion and maybe irritation. But imagine it's an emergency and it's only you and that other person alone in the room. You repeat what you need over and over as your voice grows louder and they look back at you with a blank stare. So you start to scramble to find a different way to communicate, but your heart beats faster, that tension rises, and you start choking on those feelings of confusion, anxiety, fear, desperation, and hopelessness. That is what a queer survivor of sexual violence faces when confronting systems, institutions, and people that do not speak their language. My work and my passion is serving queer survivors of sexual violence. By day, I run the In Power program, which is the first program in the nation designed specifically to meet the needs of LGBTQ survivors of sexual violence. The In Power program, its staff and patients truly give me life. By night, I'm a clinical psychologist with a private practice specializing in LGBT mental health and trauma. So over the course of my career, I've had the privilege of sharing in the healing journey of hundreds of queer survivors of sexual violence. And their stories are unique and complex and punctuated by resilience. But today I'm gonna to share just a small part of one person's story. 
a person I'm going to call Rain. Rain was a queer trans woman of color in her early 20s that moved to Chicago because Chicago offered this queer utopia, this opportunity to go by her pronouns, her chosen name, and be surrounded by people that not only validated her identities, but shared them. Rain came to see me about a year after moving, presenting with high levels of anxiety. In our work together, it became clear that she was experiencing significant violence in her intimate relationship. Rain's live-in partner would threaten to out her at work, repeatedly said hurtful and harmful things about her body, and again, over and over, told her that no one would ever love her because she was trans. All of this was a means to manipulate, force, and coerce Rain into sex, sex that for her was never consensual. But Rain never called these experiences rape or sexual assault because they were normalized by friends who shared similar experiences and invalidated by her family that loved this partner and couldn't imagine them causing this much harm. So the work Rain and I did centered on consent, safety planning around the violence, and finding ways just to help her make it through the day. And we were making real progress. That was until Rain got a new job that required her to take the train to work. She used to tell me that day after day on that train, people would say horrible transphobic things about her body or would touch her inappropriately. I remember her so clearly telling me, when I'm on that train, my body doesn't belong to me, it belongs to them. And then Rain was raped at a party. She woke up not remembering exactly what happened, but knew something in her body did not feel right. So like the good survivor, she went to the hospital for a rape kit. And when she checked in, the receptionist was unable to gather her pronouns or chosen name and the medical record. And what that meant is when she was called back, when it was her turn, she was called by her dead name. Her dead name is the male name assigned at birth. The name that doesn't fit for who she is, the name that invalidates every core of her being, the name that causes her harm. But Rain swallowed that pain mustered the courage and went back to the exam room where she crawled on the table next to that scratchy gown. She looked down at her wrist to the medical ID bracelet that so boldly pronounced her dead name. Yet another reminder of her invisibility in a system designed to protect and support survivors. And then Rain overheard the nurse say, we have a code R in exam room three. He wants to do a rape kit, so we have to call the police. But before we do, does anyone know how to do a rape kit on him? you know, on someone like him. And with that, Rain's anxiety mounted so high, she panicked and fled the emergency room without the care she not only needed, but deserved and was her right. Rain's friends and family did not speak her language when they didn't understand the sexual abuse in her relationship. The medical system literally did not speak her language when they were unable to capture her pronouns or chosen name in an electronic medical record. And the nurse certainly didn't speak her language when the nurse continued to misgender her and felt unprepared to do a trans-competent rape kit. Rain was pleading and begging for help from systems, institutions, and people that did not speak her language. They spoke the language of the white, straight, female survivor. I hope that Rain's story demonstrates that the language we have that dictates our programming and how we talk to and about survivors is not just incomplete and insufficient, but it causes harm. So in order to end sexual violence for all people, we need to learn Rain's language. Learning this language matters because sexual violence is expensive. It's expensive to survivors who experience physical and mental health consequences, might lose their job, be unable to pay for rent, or have to drop out of school. Sexual violence is expensive to families who can feel torn apart, children that can go unnoticed, and partners that can go neglected. And if that's not enough, sexual violence is expensive to society. The CDC estimates that it costs $122,461 to provide the lifetime care for a single survivor. That equates to $3.1 trillion. Learning this new language matters because we have a real opportunity to create a solution that is not just equal but is equitable. And unfortunately, in this nation, we have a history of generating solutions that are incomplete, insufficient, and cause harm. Whether that is the Emancipation Proclamation, the way we have treated indigenous people, or the Second Amendment. These solutions were designed to create an equal playing field, but what they did was leave the playing field filled with landmines. If we do not address this issue in its entirety, it will be an issue that rages into perpetuity in the same way that gun violence and racism do. 
Learning this new language matters because it is the foundation of that complete solution. And in the words of Audre Lorde, there is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And Rain, like every queer survivor of sexual violence I have ever worked with, experienced multiple traumas. Because remember that sexual violence is violence. And so too is the homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, toxic masculinity, so sexism, ableism, heteronormativity, classism, racism, community violence that queer people face every day. Learning this new language is tough, and it requires an investment. And I can understand that that list of isms that I just shared might be new and foreign to some people, and that's okay. Because like with learning any new language, there will be terms you don't know. So I implore you to ask me or look it up for yourself because it is that curiosity which drives us forward towards the complete solution we need. And now I know that today we're not going to generate that complete solution or learn this new language in its entirety. So my hope is to leave you with action steps that every person can do. And better yet, every person has a responsibility to do. It's three simple steps. The first step is something we already know something we were taught by our parents or our preschool teachers, and that is to keep our hands and our feet to ourselves. Whether you are 4, 14, 40, gay or straight, this rule applies to you without exception. Because the first step in ending sexual violence is respecting each other's bodies. And if we can remember that, there is no limit to the success and progress of our nation. Step two is reimagining the golden rule. The golden rule isn't just to treat others how we want to be treated. It is also to treat others how they want to be treated. We need to challenge our own assumptions that we have about the queer community, and that starts with assuming that everybody is straight and cisgender. And by cisgender, I mean sex assigned at birth matching gender identity. So whether we're here talking about survivors, the barista at Starbucks, or our family or friends, Straight and cisgender is not and cannot be the norm. Reimagining the golden rule means asking people their pronouns and using them. It means introducing ourselves with our own, whether we're at a cocktail party, corporate function, or community space. Hi, I'm Paige Baker Braxton, and I use she, her pronouns. I promise the more you practice, the easier it gets. And reimagining the golden rule means respecting other people's autonomy and choice over how they present, what they want to be called, and who they love. And the third step is engaging in allyship with the community of queer survivors. And what that looks like is engaging in warfare against people and institutions that cause harm. It means getting in the trenches and fighting alongside the queer and trans people of color already doing this movement work and uplifting and centering their voices. It means voting for elected officials that support queer and trans rights and tangible steps to ending sexual violence. And engaging in allyship with the community of queer survivors means renewing our nation's commitment to never leaving a person behind. Sexual violence is not about sex, it is about power and control, and the people in this audience have the power and control to be forces of action and vehicles of change in ending this public health crisis that is sexual violence. And to all the survivors in the audience, your stories are real and important and you are believed. And know that I stand with you today in health, in support, in pride, and in power. Thank you.